Ladies and gentlemen, it is my very high honor and privilege to award the Notre Dame Prize for Religious Liberty to Ambassador Mary Ann Glendon. Forgive me if I'm a bit emotional <laughs> after seeing that film. I don't quite know what to say. I think since uh, Dean Cole quoted Lyndon Johnson, I'm going to have to borrow from Hubert Humphrey and say, if my parents had seen that film, my father would have been proud and my mother would have believed it. <laughs> this. This is a very heartwarming occasion for me, not only because Notre Dame Law School is such a vibrant center for the intellectual, the uh, clinical, every aspect of religious freedom, but for me personally, I'm so grateful that Notre Dame Law School for many years and many occasions has really been a home away from home for me. And I thank you so much for that. And I thank all of you on the Notre Dame faculty who have inspired me and encouraged me in our joint enterprise. When Dean Cole first told me that I was going to receive this award, my thoughts traveled back many years to a wonderful gift that I received from Notre Dame's legendary president, Theodore Hesper. It was at a time in my life when I was beginning to read Freud, Marx, and Darwin, and when I was quite unaware of the pretensions of some of their theories to become total philosophies. I imagine many of you have been there. And it just happened that at that time, so perilous for young Catholics, at that time I came across a syndicated newspaper column by Theodore Hesburgh, in which he said one sentence that jumped out on me. And that sentence was, if you're confronted with a conflict between science and religion, you're either dealing with a bad theologian or a bad scientist. <laughs> and it's no exaggeration to say that that one sentence had an enormous effect on my life. It helped me from falling into many of the pitfalls that lay ahead in the wild, wild world of higher education. And uh, when I did fall in, many of you have been there, and when I did fall into some of them, it helped me to reorient myself toward the great goals of liberal education, the cultivation of independent thinking, the pursuit of truth, and striving to be able to make balanced and informed judgments among competing views. A few words can have a great deal of power. And those of us who have watched the growing influence of human rights language over the past several years are well aware of the fact that words have or can have great power. But words can also be two-edged swords. And the playwright activist Václav Havel noticed that and wrote even at the time of the fall of the Berlin Wall, he said, Words can be rays of light in a realm of darkness, but they also can be lethal arrows. And sometimes, the noblest human enterprises can be turned against themselves. And indeed, the same language of human rights that once inspired so many to hope for a better world is being used today to advance agendas in which religious freedom is regularly attacked and downplayed. What we're witnessing is nothing less than a direct attack on a fundamental principle of international human rights law. That is the principle that no right that has been internationally recognized as universal, no basic right can be ignored or 
totally subordinated to another right. Nevertheless, we see that pick and choose approach to human rights, that deconstructionist frenzy is becoming dominant in the liberal democracies, in the foreign policy of the liberal democracies, and is well entrenched in many international organizations. So how should we think about the increasing number of situations where religious freedom comes in conflict with other important goods? It seems to me that in a democratic society, the question that we ought to be asking is something, it's a version of Aristotle's question, how should free persons in a democratic society figure out ways in which they can, people of different beliefs, we figure out ways in which they can protect everyone's rights to the maximum extent possible. Now, that's not the question that foes of religious freedom are beginning to ask. They're beginning to ask questions like, how can people with different views be run out of their jobs? How can their businesses be closed? How can we undermine their institutions? And the people who think like that and act like that don't want us to know what Elder Oaks has emphasized so eloquently and what every good religious freedom lawyer knows, and that is that reasonable accommodations are easier to achieve than enemies of religious freedom would have us believe. In most cases, not in all, obviously, not in all, but in most cases, there is a solution that can be worked out through ordinary democratic political processes. In many cases, a religious exemption will solve the problem. Some people will tell you that religious exemptions are a license to discriminate, but what that usually means is that it's okay to discriminate against religion whenever it comes in conflict with something that they deem more important. The fact is, and what the polls tell us, is that reasonable accommodations are exactly what most American people want. So against that background, the stunning recent victories for religious freedom in the US Supreme Court are truly something to celebrate. And congratulations to all of you here who had a role in making those victories possible. But, <laughs> but here comes the but. But we shouldn't kid ourselves about what those legal victories did and did not achieve. What most of them achieved, and this is no small thing, was to remove barriers, clear space for religious freedom to be exercised. But what will count ultimately where the preservation of religious freedom is concerned is what people do in that space. What's the good of clearing the space if the people it was cleared for don't use it? Or if they give in too easily when they should be asserting it, or if they don't exercise it responsibly. And while I'm speaking of the challenges that are still ahead, let's not forget that in other parts of the world, places where the most violent and shocking forms of religious persecution are taking place, things are not getting better. In fact, according to the Pew Forum, they're at their highest level since the Pew Forum started counting them in 2007. So it seems to me that what this means for friends of religious freedom is that we still have a great deal of work to do and the challenges ahead are still formidable. We need to demonstrate convincingly that religious freedom is not just about protecting religious people and institutions, we need to demonstrate convincingly that religious freedom is conducive to the maintenance of democracy, peace, and healthy economies, and religious leaders need to motivate their followers to exercise their freedom in ways that actually show the value of religion and religious freedom.
to society. I'll conclude with just two thoughts. When I was a member of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, and some of you here remember what that experience is like, we traveled to many countries where people were being tortured, arbitrarily arrested, imprisoned, and even killed for their religious beliefs. And when I think of how much those people told us, how much they said they counted on the United States to show leadership in championing human rights, including religious freedom, when I think of those conversations, it is painful to see that the protection of religious freedom is faltering in US foreign policy and faltering in the foreign policy of other liberal democracies. And finally, in the Commission's travels, it was always touching to hear people say how they thought of the United States as an example, a model of a society where persons of all faiths and no faith not only could coexist in relative harmony, but could actually flourish. That has been a sign of hope for so many around the world. It's been a great strength of our unique democratic experiment, and it would be a tragedy if we were to let it slip away now. And so I thank Notre Dame Law School, and I thank all of you friends of religious liberty here for everything you have done, everything you are doing, everything you will do to make sure that that does not happen. Thank you. <laughs>